Okay, so if everybody could start to take their seats, we're going to start off our keynote panel with uh, a short video that's going to give you uh, a sense of who our keynote is named after. Segment, I just want to say a little bit about that. So that's Ida Lewis, and that's who this next segment is named after. She's an incredible shero that we need to pay homage to. She is alive. And why that 2024 is there is that we're hoping to do something to help celebrate her 90th birthday, either with a documentary or something. So one of my really dear friends, Allison Davis, here made that video. But the short SBC grad, com SBC grad, I'm a com SBC grad, 76. But why I'm just so elated that this is happening and happening in a time frame where we can celebrate her is because of what it meant to me so personally. So I invited um, Ms. Lewis to come up to speak when I was working for the Martin Luther King Center. Um, I guess it was back in 1975. And she came up to speak and I drove her to Logan Airport and she said, wow, you're not gonna let me out of the car until I give you an internship. And I was like, well, something like that. Because the thing that, that we didn't have a video for is the fact that she published the first, uh, she was the first black woman to publish a national magazine, Encore American and Worldwide News. So a lot of people do realize that she was one of the first editors of Essence, but she then went on to publish this magazine. And um, I was able to talk her into giving me an internship, and then I worked there for a year and got coffee and answered the phone and did all that. But it was an incredible experience, and I owe her so much. And I found this copy upstairs in my attic. This is the copy with my first byline of my first article that was published here. So anyway, thank you for indulging. And remember Ida, and we'll talk about her next year. Hello, everyone. Thank you for sticking around for our closing keynote panel. Honored to be moderating a panel that's named after Ida Lewis and also honored to be moderating alongside my most esteemed panelists, Michelle Hurd and Russell Hornsby. Give it up, thank you for coming. Are we on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Brianne Garrett. I am managing editor for Sweet July, and I'm also a proud alum of the College of Communication, a class of 2018, which feels both <laughs> so long ago and like yesterday, which I'm sure you can say the same to CFA alums. <laughs> a little bit longer than yesterday, but yes, yes. I still believe in it, though. <laughs> So we're here today to talk about you know, a very important topic and that is the entertainment industry. And before we get into it, you, know, you two know yourselves the best. Um, I would love for you each to introduce yourself how you see fit and we will start with Michelle. Um, hi everyone, uh, Michelle Hurd, I'm an actor. Um, I'm also part of the sag After Negotiating Committee. I'm the, thank you, I'm the National Vice President of sag After Los Angeles and the Chair of the Sexual Harassment Prevention Committee. Um, I take the uh, union uh, very strongly and uh, you know, it, this is a moment in time that we have to make this change because this is a labor use mo moment in time for all of us. Um, so this negotiation is really important. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Russell Hornsby, class of 1996, uh, School of Fine Arts, which is presently the College of Fine Arts. And uh, uh, I'm an actor by both profession and trade and uh, just uh, happy and excited to be here. Uh, for this alumni weekend. Thank you. So, you know, we're going to get into the important work that you're doing shortly, but I first want to take a walk down memory lane uh, and kind of just understand the biggest ways since you've started your careers that you've seen the industry change, how it has evolved, what are some of the challenges, some of the successes. Walk me through that. Michelle, we'll start with you. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, I'm sure Russell and I both can tell you that there are more projects for people of color now, which we're so happy about. Um, I think that's also because there's more people of color who are also behind the camera. You know, there's this thing about putting us in front of the camera and it's sort of like, oh, look at this, we've got our little dancing monkeys here, you know, and we're not. We have to have people behind the scenes, writers, directors, producers, um, crew, cameramen, all of that stuff, and, and by doing that, it becomes more diversified. I find that for women, 
um, and women of a certain age, there's more uh, scripted uh, pieces for us to do now, which is phenomenal. Yep. Um, so this is a, a, a slow movement, but it's a movement because we're not going anywhere. We're here, we're loud, and we're not, uh, we won't be silenced. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, just to uh, echo Michelle's thoughts, I, I did, uh, I do see that there are more opportunities for, for African Americans, for black um, and people of color. Uh, I, I was able to see when I was doing theater, the, the, the sort of the shift um, ha happen when uh, I, I noticed that um, when I was, I was 20, about 26 years old, out of school for about two or three years, that these for me happening as a series regular and not just a guest star. And I would talk to uh, actors who are about uh, 20, 20 years my senior, and they would tell me, impress upon me, understand how lucky and how fortunate you are to have this opportunity as a series regular because we were just guest stars and people just walking through and you have a really have an opportunity to make an impact and then able to see then you know five to ten years later as michelle articulated that there was an increase in writers there was an increase in directors there was a, an increase of black showrunners so which gave you the opportunity to say now we're in that decision-making process where you're not just uh, a, a token. We are now making a conscious decision and choice to pick said uh, black actor or actress to lead or to be a part of, of this ensemble. So it's been a, a nice, slow, but, but uh, steady sea change. And one of the things that still needs to change is the equity, pay equity. Because there's still this really annoying, insidious thing in my industry that if you are a person of color, you're at the base when it comes to pay, and that's unacceptable. Oh, and what a perfect segue into the next question, which is the idea of advocacy, both on a personal level and you know, community-wide. Being more established in your career now, how are you feeling more empowered to ask for um, and, and stand up for yourself as far as pay equity, but as far as opportunity across the board? I think that's a you know a, a byproduct of having an opportunity. I think that you know I look up, and you know you've been in this business as a as a working actor for twenty years, and I now have the the strength and the courage of my convictions to now finally say no, uh, when that opportunity, when the pay is not equitable, when it's not proper, it's not right. I look up and I can say to my representatives, I'm not doing that, and and we can we can really fully articulate a, as to why. Uh, and, I, and I also will say that I'm finding now, um, you know, everybody's catching on, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, a, I'm finding that agents, uh, primarily uh, white agents, want to be on the good side of history. Mm -hmm. and, and so how that manifested itself was I was uh, doing a, a show called The Hunt for the Bone Collector, and it was the first time I was a definitive lead of a show. And I was set up to make a, a nice certain amount of money. And they had offered me, uh, they had under uh, offer well below what I expected. So then now, my agent now gets on the phone and says, you know this is racist, right? Say <laughs> those words. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 you can't say, no, 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 because you know, I've had said actor who was white and he was paid this much, who does not have the, the cue of Russell, da, 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 da. And so you have to, you know, you have to pay them. And because now you have, you know, as, as um, Dick Gregory always said, there got to be some good white people. It's gotta be. That's right. and, and so when you have those good white people on your side advocating for you, that's how that change starts to, begins to happen when we're talking about, you know, equity pay and, and other and things of that nature. And what was it we were just talking about out there? Uh, not a, uh, allies, uh, accomplice. We need accomplice. That's right. We need some accomplice. And I have to say, one of the things that happened to me was uh, one of the shows that I did. Um, and I'd done many TV shows at that point, and then my agents had cast myself and this white actor. The white actor was their very first job, and they were getting twice as much as I was being paid, and I was furious about it, and I was like, what the fuck, what is this? And my, my people said, I know, Michelle, it's unfair, but you're a woman of color, and you're at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to pay. And those words I will remember forever because that's what got me into this, into doing union work. Because I am obsessed with legislation, contracts, liability. 
I want to hold people accountable. I want to put things in a CBA, in a collective bargaining agreement, so that there is no um, question about my pay. You know, what's insidious is that we have young artists who are supposed to advocate for themselves when they are fearful for losing that job. I don't want to have to put that strain on them. I want it in our contracts. I want there to be fair pay for people of color. I don't care whether male, female, non-binary, whatever the hell, what age we are, if I'm doing this job, I get the same pay as this other person and it doesn't matter that they're white and I'm this color. You pay me the same thing, I'm doing the same exact work. So that's what literally got me into doing union work because I was like, well, how can I uh, make an impact, make a change, a systemic change? And it's sort of like, you know, I, I'm, you know I'm a New Yorker and uh, you know, we have co-ops, you know, you get into a co-op, and I remember my parents telling me, you know what a co-op is, if you buy, you know, if you have an apartment and it's a co-op, that means there's a co-op board that's going to vote on things that happen in your apartment. What? Well, then I want to be on that co-op board. So just like, well, you are voting on my apartment? Oh, no, no, no. So that's just like why I want to be part of SAG-AFTRA, the, you know, do my union work, because this is my contract. This is my contract, and I know that when I speak, <laughs> I'm always going to speak about POC, period. That's what's going to come out of my mouth. It's who I am. It's how I live. I'm the daughter of activists. So get ready. When we have contracts, I will always talk about making sure that we have POCs that are empowered and paid in, in full equity. And I love that comparison with co-ops. It's, it's a good reference That's point. That's my apartment you're voting on? Oh, no, That's no, no. That's it. <laughs> Where I live? Yeah. Um, so I want to, you know, we talked about accomplices. We talked about allies. But let's talk about the importance of a mentorship. Uh, and removing the gatekeeping, uh, building access. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote an article called The Off-Book Mentorship Cycles of Media's Elite. Uh, this idea of you know, providing access for these up-and-coming industry professionals. Can you two talk about the importance of that um, and, and, and why and how it's you know, important to sort of the success of black media? Well, for, you know, first and foremost, I think that I believe mentorship is vitally important uh, for young people and for old people, or for elders or whatever, or people of experience. <laughs> um, but, I, but I also think that mentorship, as far as from my lens, it, it needs to be organic, uh, especially when we're dealing with something that is as personal as the arts or as performance. And, and I think that what, what has happened in, in the past for, for a while, you know, older, elder people haven't been in contact with younger people. And so therefore they're not able to build those vital relationships where they can talk and converse and exchange numbers so they can have a dialogue or so that a young person can share what is going on, you know, with them in their life and their career and so that you can give, you know, good advice and whatnot. You know, what I like to do is I, I like to establish, you know, a personal relationship with young actors um, to whatever extent. I'm always giving out my number. I'm always giving out my email. I'm always, uh, you know, encouraging young artists to, you know, call me, you know, send me an email. I, I have an open door policy. I'm an open book, whatever you need. And I encourage them to use it. And I, I think it's important that we do, we, we have to now reach to, to, to them. We have to reach down, right? Uh, lift as we climb and let younger people know that we're here for you and that we have, we are a resource and that you should use us whenever possible. And you know, to, to piggyback on what Arsul was saying, there's been, a, there's been this kind of insidious um, ground, uh, like foundation of people of color in this industry, right? There's the whole thing about the token, right? There's one black person on that show. There's one Latino on that show. There's one Asian on that show. And over time, what that made was uh, these actors being vulnerable and fearful for losing that job, right? And so it, it sort of cut, up, cut off the ability for us to mentor because we were fearful and we had to sort of keep mine, right? Again, that's one of the reasons why I was like, well, then let me just get into legislation. <laughs> Let me just get into this paperwork. Like one of the things that I um, have advocated for, which really helped some, so many of the people on my show of Star Trek, was our second season. I was like, Michelle, you need to put your mouth, your, your actions where your mouth is. And I advocated to have people of color in the hair and makeup trailer. One of the things that myself and a couple of other actors in our union are working on is to codify the Crown Act, right? The Crown Act is our 
fabulous crown, right? Creating a respectable a world for natural curls. And because we should not be discriminated <laughs> because we want to let our hair be the way it is to get a job. And, in, or, and, and by doing that, we were able to tap into the fear of liability for the studios because they, there's a now a law that's codified in, 20, in 12 states um, that they could get uh, sued if they don't have. Now, by advocating for people of color, I remember this young, beautiful, dark-skinned sister, Ito, who came to do uh, The Young Guinan on my show, and I was on set, and she came over to me and she said, um, you know, the hair and makeup people told me to come over to you to say thank you. And I said, oh, what's, what's going on? She says, Michelle, I came to set today like I have come to every show I've ever done with my suitcase full of all my hair care products and my foundation. And when I opened that door and I saw a person of color in the hair and makeup trailer, I cried because I realized for the first time, all I have to do is my job. So I try to advocate in any way I can by setting those things up to help the many. You know, I would love that we, you know, to have more of a mentorship program. It, it, our industry, it doesn't really allow us to do that anymore. We have to feel strong and confident that we're not going to be fired, that we're not going to be chastised, that there's not going to be replications, in which they, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that that happens. But by informing, empowering our artists, letting them know that their, what their rights are, and that they can advocate for themselves or have their people advocate for them, have their agents say, that's racist, mm -hmm. say it, then we empower our youth. And at this point, that's the best way that I have found to mentor and advocate for our youth. And to, but also to that point though, the more of us that are on set, the easier it is to find those mentors yeah. because now they're readily available. So all that activism that Michelle has done and is doing to get makeup, to get hair, to get people in front of, behind the camera, uh, DPs and, and et cetera, they're there now to say, hey, I can help you. I'm here to help you where that wasn't the case before. Yeah, I think it goes back to Russell, what you said about organic mentorship. Yes. You two are, you know, are likely mentors to people who you aren't even aware of. And that's, you know, it's a great reality. Um, I want to get into the sort of idea of black legacy uh, specific to Hollywood and entertainment. There is often this misconception that uh, black film is of lesser quality, which we, of course, know is anything but the truth. Can you speak to that and, and perhaps reference some examples of, of, of just the legacy that we are cementing in entertainment's history? I mean, there's so many, you know, I, my godfather was Godfrey Cambridge, you know, if uh, anybody knows who Godfrey Cambridge was back in the day, right? Watermelon Man, that's right. Um, you know, there's so, first of all, the concept of black film being sub, sub, sub <laughs> is something that's been fed to us, right? So we can choose to not listen to that. And it's really important for us to advocate, again, for those things. Like, I, uh, I always go to a movie theater, to a movie that's a, predominantly black film, I go to the theater because it's important to put money in the box office so that the powers that be can see that we generate money. It's not until we do that that we can really uh, make change. What was the biggest one that did that? Black Panther. All of a sudden, all the studios were like, mm, so people show up. Yes, you may, we will show up because we support each other. We know that. We've done this for since the beginning of time. Black people have always, you know, rallied to try to make sure that we, you know, move the moral compass of this, you know, United States forward <laughs> as they tried to keep us back. So it's literally about, you know, reaching out, changing that language, changing that, uh, those statements, um, supporting as best you can any kind of project with people of color, um, all colors. You know, it's funny, right? We have always for, you know, decades now watched majority white films, right? I've watched white films and I've been pretty me it's been pretty easy for me to understand what's going on, right? I don't need subtitles, I got it. The concept that if we do black films, it's just, oh well, I'm not sure if the rest of the public are going to understand that. Why? We've been doing the opposite for this entire time. It's time. I want to see a film with uh, a full Korean cast. I want to see a full Japanese cast. I want to see a full black cast. Tell me your life experience. This is the only way that we get connected as human beings. So it's imperative to seek those things out. Look for them. Don't look at just the shiny ab objects. Look for the things that, are being try that people are trying to marginalize, trying to reduce by saying it's subpar. <laughs> Support it. It's, again, 
education, information, amplification. It's the, the way to make change. You know, I also think when we're talking about legacy, we're talking about black film and, and TV and, and, and also theater. We, we've always done the work. We've always had a high standard for what we want to do and what we want to produce and what we want to put out. I think the key thing that we're always been focused on is that we've done the work. They say the work is for the audience, but on the arts terms. The saying used to be, it's a black thing you wouldn't understand. No, the reality is it's a black thing. Let me help you understand. And so what we're saying with this, with this legacy of what we've put forth is see us in our natural state, see us in our natural humanity for who we are. We are not going to lessen ourselves. We're not going to subjugate ourselves to try to prove to you that we're worthy. We're asking you to step up, take, take a seat, sit down, listen and absorb who we are and what, we, what we're bringing to the table. And if you do take time to listen and understand, you will understand that we are just like you. So when we look back historically, we look at the Gordon Parks and the Gordon Parks Juniors, when we're looking at the, the Learning Tree and we're looking at Superfly and Ozzie Davises, and then we go and we look at the films like Claudine that are talking about our lives and our struggles and who we are to try and define humanity, not for the white man, not for a dominant culture, but the humanity within ourselves, right? And we're continuing that today. I think the key when we're talking about legacy is also what are we doing to push that forward, right? So I think as the proliferation of media, of black media continues to grow, right? I think that it, it is incumbent upon us all to give what we have and what we can. What do I mean by that? Now, when we have people such as myself and Michelle and others who are in front of the camera, who are in the limelight, there are gonna be other people who are behind, who are certain producers, who are directors, who are there to give of themselves for free for a small you know, opportunity just to say, hey, I want to make sure that I'm a part of lifting this, this up. And I think that's also important when we're talking about legacy because Michelle knows what the history of film and, and television and theater, as do I, as do many others. So if we're here to be on certain sets or be a part of certain productions to give, it, to, to give certain context to certain things, because there's a lot of opportunities happening and a lot of young people may not understand the, the historical context of certain things. So our presence is vitally important. And that's how when we teach uh, about our past, you, you know, we're helping to give to our, our future because we're in the present. And I think that's important. That was a word. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's talk about how we measure success. Uh, we all know snubs with these, you know, major coveted, supposedly award platforms are very commonplace, especially among black actors and black professionals in the industry. How do we own our own success and measure it? What are the other ways that, you know, physical awards can't provide? What it, mm -hmm. Well, one really good thing is to call out the, um, you know, well, sorry, but the bullshit behind some of those awards. Wasn't it the Golden Globes that we found out that there was like eight white old men who basically decide all of them? What, what, uh, uh, <laughs> and some women too. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's crazy, but that's one of the things, again, like what I was saying, it's not enough just to be in front. We have to be the ones deciding, you know, and, and truthfully, for at least my point of view and, and, you know, what I ask for whenever I create any kind of committee is that I want everybody in the room I want everybody in the room. I want all POCs in the room. I want LGBTQ in the room. I want PW, performers with disabilities in the room. I want neurodiverse individuals in the room because then I'm informed. If I say something ignorant, somebody can go, excuse me, totally clueless, let me educate you. That's the kind of stuff that needs to happen when it comes to awards. You know, success is such an interesting thing, isn't it? Especially in our industry, because you can get a, you know, I, I always say that, um, I mean, maybe not appropriate, but acting is like the, the biggest drug addiction because you, you get a gig and you are so high, you are so high and you ride that high for so long, the job is over, but you're still on that high. And then all of a sudden you start going down and you start freaking and you start freaking out and you're like, I will never get a job again. Lord help me, you start freaking out. Then you get one job and you are high again. So what is success? Mm -hmm. Is success being able to take, provide for your family? Is success being able to fulfill yourself as an artist? Is success getting an award? 
to me, the award seems to be the least important in that category, right? I want to be fulfilled. I want to take care of my family. I want to continue this journey of telling stories. Sacred art form. It's been around forever. It's literally the network, the fabric that connects us as human beings. Art, right? It doesn't matter the language. You hear a song. You see a painting. You see a sculpture. You, you, you watch a dance. You see an actor perform, and you are connecting with each other. That's, a hum that's, that's humanity. That's success. The fact that I could do something, tell a story as a woman of color, and then maybe somebody in, I don't even know, Spartanburg, Carolina, who's never even interacted with a person of color could see my, me doing some performance and understand me, that is successful. Indeed. I, I think that we have to look at the chicanery that's behind the awards, quite honestly. I think, you know, the awards, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about being an objective award in a subjective industry. Art is subjective. And so basically all, all they are, they're, they, are, they are awards of popularity, right? So we have to really ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Why did we get into this industry or, or in, in the first place? It was to express ourselves. And, and as Michelle stated, the, the success is the opportunity. That is the success. This, the, the success is about pension and health. Yeah. That is a success. The success is being able to keep your lights on, to be able to pay that rent, to be a working performer, a working actor, a working artist, not a celebrity. And I think, that's, I think that's the difference because we're not chasing, the success isn't about being able to provide or having the opportunity. The success comes with the idea that I want to be a celebrity. <laughs> and I think, we're, and so we're, we're, we're looking at it wrong. And we, we should not be looking at what award I'm supposed to attain or, or get, it's what opportunity did I get? And I think, you know, even, even so much as when we looked at, when we started to get more opportunities in film and in television, and we saw so much talent come to the fore, so many beautiful actors and artists and uh, directors and writers and all of that, at every turn, what did we say? They deserve an award. <laughs> at every turn, said, oh, they should, they should win. Angela should have won. What? Why are we focused on that? What we should have been focused? We had 10 more opportunities where there were none. Mm. There are 10 more, there, there's 30 more people who are able to pay into the union, who are able to get their pension and health. There are 100 more people who are able to put food on the table where there were none. Oh, that's, right. that's the victory. That's yep. That is success, thank you. Okay. And I think th that's what we need to continue to believe and to think as we move forward. It's about who are we lifting? Mm. Who are we giving opportunities to? Not about who are we having to come up to the to podium or to the lectern to give a thank you, uh, uh, to give a thank you to, for receiving an award. Well, you two have taken the definition of success to whole new levels, which I uh, knew you would, uh, but we can't talk about success or failure without talking about ongoing Hollywood strikes. Um, Michelle, you obviously are very, very involved in SAG-AFTRA. Can you speak to your involvement, its importance, the progress, where you see it going? Yeah, and I'm just going to give you guys like, like the little sound bite because I really want everybody to understand what this uh, strike is about. SAG-AFTRA is 160,000 strong performers that consist of voiceover artists, singers, dancers, background artists, stunt coordinators, stunt performers, principal actors, right? So 160,000 strong. Out of 160,000 strong, 98% make less than $12 an hour. 87% of our 160,000 strong do not qualify, meaning they do not make, they don't qualify for the health care, which is 26,000 a year. 87% of 160,000 people do not make 26,000 a year. There's this concept of actors as these elitists, right? That's one, 2% of the 160,000 strong. I use myself as an example to make that clear. When you watch television shows, I don't care what TV show, whatever you're thinking right now, it could be on linear television or it could be streaming platforms, whatever the, your favorite TV show is, right? I can do one, two, three, even four guest spots on those fabulous shows that you're thinking about. 
You can even think of the shows that you've seen me guest spot on, right? Now you guys will see me and be like, damn, Michelle's doing it, she's working it, working it, she's doing all stuff. The reality is, I can do those three, two, three, four guest spots. And because I have been forced to take something called top of show, which is the base minimum that producers will pay me, it's not in the SAG after contracts, it's a concept terminology that the AMPTP came up with. Because I'm forced to take that base minimum, I can do those three or four guest spots in one year, and I still will not make the 26,000 a year to qualify for my health insurance. So you see me and you think, she's working. What you see is an actor hustling to make my rent, to put food on my table. This is literally a labor issue, a working class issue. The concept that somebody who makes $80,000 a day can actually say to a body of people, 160,000, that we're being unrealistic because we would like to make 26,000 a year is egregious. This is just a baseline of what we're fighting for. AI, artificial intelligence, is really, um, is so imperative right now. We, sag after and WGA, are the shiny objects. We're the shiny objects that everybody can sort of see, oh look, they're talking about AI. AI affects all of you. Every single one of them, out, everyone out here. It's not just actors. Things already have your algorithms. They already have your sounds, what you like. You can already get calls from people who, uh, who have the sound of your partners, your children, your whatevers, and, and, and tell you to give them money because they have that technology. It's going to, imp it's not going to, it is already impacting all of us. Do you know that the AMPTP put a pro offer across the table for background artists, that when they do one day of work, one day of work for a background artist, which is $150, maybe $187, it's below $200, that they can scan that one actor for that one day of $150, they can keep my avatar in their library to utilize in any form what they want in perpetuity, and they will never see another penny. Meaning I could sit in a movie theater or in my house watching television and go, is that me? And literally, they have the right to do this. This is a proposal the ANPTP put across our, our table. So this fight is literally um, a labor issue. And it's what all of our unions, all, all of the industries right now, healthcare, teachers, uh, custodians, auto industry, everybody is fighting for. This is the time that we have to draw a line in the, the sand. I think I just said this to somebody that we used to speak about 10, 15 years ago about individuals making millions of dollars, right? Ooh, I want to make millions. I can't wait. 2023, we talk about individuals making billions of dollars. If we don't draw this line in the sands right now, in 10 years, we're going to talk about individuals making trillions of dollars. And if individuals are making trillions of dollars, what is everybody else making? This is the moment in time that this has to change. This is a real fight. It's, we're on the right side of history, and I believe in it. So I have, and as I said, I have activist parents. I have to have hope, so I have hope that it will resolve, and we will win what we need to win. Oh, and just one more insidious thing, just a tiny little insidious thing. Our pension and health contributions, which is our health care, you might have heard that like a few years ago, some of our older members were kicked off. Our pension and health, which is their caps that they contribute to our health and pension fund every time we do a job, they have not been raised for 40 years, since 1983. Show me any vocation that hasn't reflected inflation like that. 40 years. This is why this, this fight is so imperative. Yeah, and you hit the nail on the head when you alluded to it being across industries. I mean, in mine, journalism, News Guild, huge advocate for it, unionizing within any industry is imperative. Yeah. Um, let's do a little forecasting. And Russell, I'll start with you. Um, when it comes to the future of this industry, what do you hope to see? Talking about being hopeful, what do you hope to see? <clears throat> well, I, ultimately, I hope to see more of us, more black people, more people of color uh, creating, uh, innovating. Uh, for, for the arts, I think uh, innovating for society and in, you know, in politics as well. 
Uh, I, I think that it's very something that's very capable that that can and will happen because I'm um, you know noticing that you know there is there is a, a coming together when you have events like these and have bring an opportunity for people to meet each other over different cross section of disciplines and industries. It helps the uh, you know just the communication uh, opportunities uh, that uh, you know help end up creating themselves, and uh, you know and also I'm just hopeful that there will for selfishly that there will be an industry in in five to ten to fifteen to twenty years that uh, that my kids may want to go into um, that uh, you know will still be able to support and and make a living off of you know as Michelle said when you talk about from going from people making millions to billions to possibly trillions there becomes less and less you know for the middle people less and less for the least of these and, you know, as she stated, this is the time now, you know, to fight. We're standing at the scratch line. And uh, if we don't do it now, tomorrow, uh, you know, won't exist. I mean, he says really sage words. Because the writers, the WGA, SAG-AFTRA, if we don't make this change in 10 years, being an artist will not be a viable vocation, period. Period. We're literally going to be, yeah, the sort of, you know, concept of the, you know, the gypsies. So when I say I'm an actor, they're like, oh, that's cute. What do you do for your day job? That will literally be the truth. You know, when Orange is the New Black came out, remember how huge that was? Everybody was like, Orange is the New Black, it was great. Everybody, people were dressing up like the characters for Halloween, the whole thing. Do you know that those, all those actresses <laughs> who were on those shows, all were getting top of show, all of them had day jobs the entire time because what they were making on that big TV show that everybody was talking about that Netflix made a whole bunch of money from they still had to do day jobs it's a, it's ridiculous it's a billion dollar industry what do I want to see in 10 years I want to see our my industry our industry having a, a, a percentage share of the profit revenue revenue that's what I want to see I want to see proper caps contributions I want to see pay equity. I want to see people of color being prolifer all over the place, behind, in front of, all of that, and being fairly compensated. People of color, marginalized industries, uh, marginalized groups. That's what I want to see. That's, and I, I have hope that that will happen. It's a, it's a hard battle. It's going to be challenging. It has been challenging. But the one thing that these people don't realize, the AMPTP didn't realize, is that we know struggle. We know struggle. It's what we've been doing our entire lives. This is nothing new. What they don't realize is our resolve is solid and that we will fight this until we get a fair contract. They think we're fearful of losing our houses, fearful of losing um, you know, our, our, our ability to pay for our children's education. Guess what? When my child has to be uh, pay for that, that tuition, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to figure it out. Because I know that I have to make this, this, this line in the sand right now. So I have hope, and I want to see in 10 years fair equity in our contracts. I want to see a revenue share. I want to see more people of color in front of and behind the camera. And I want to see our stories being told. Because the truth of the matter is, the moral compass of this country has always been moved by people of color. It has always been the right to get married, the right to, to sit at a counter. And you know what happens when we move the moral compass of this world? Everybody benefits. In the hair and makeup trailer, did you know that in order to get your cosmetology um, certificate, you don't have to study ethnic hair. You don't have to study ethnic. It is an elective service. Do you know if you have a person of color in the hair and makeup trailer? They're skilled to take care of every hair follicle. Everybody wins when this movement happens. That's what I hope for in the future. Yes to that, and glad you two both have hope because it's a necessary uh, agent of change and progress. 
Um, you know, I'm sure that there are aspiring or existing entertainment professionals in the audience, and for them, what piece of advice would you give for entering or staying in this industry? Um, keep the fire in your spirit. Um, I believe being an, being an artist, being in the industry, um, you have to love what you do. And, it's, and, it, and they say that you have to go in the direction that your blood beats. And that I think we have to, I try to remember and I try to instill upon uh, younger people or just people in it who ask me for advice, just to remember that you're an artist first. And, and think art first and then go to commerce or think show first, then go to business. Because it's, the, the, the industry can sap your soul and if you don't have one, it'll take everything else. Um, so just continue to follow the direction that your blood beats. And um, one other thing, um, you know, it's, I, I'm a, I don't know, I'm not a, a big social media person, you know, um, but I look at it and I was listening to a, uh, a, a professor, his name was Dr. Derek Carr, and he said something that I thought was pretty profound. and. He compared social media, Instagram, Twitter to sharecropping. And, and when he said that, when he broke that down, I thought about it. And I said, I don't, damn. You know what I mean? And so I, I think we have to just be mindful of that. You know, uh, how much of ourselves are we giving for free? How much of our souls are for sale? And, and you know what I mean? And, and are we giving this, this pound of flesh that we exert, that we give uh, just to sort of be seen, to be in the limelight, to be part of the content game? Again, I think there's a difference between being a, a producer of content and being an artist. And I think sometimes we get them confused. So I, that's why I say you have to put your artistry first so that therefore, whatever you're putting out there, it's right within your spirit, it's right within your soul, and nobody can take that away from you, versus just being a, a, a producer of, of content, where as, the, as Nipsey Russell says, there's nobody home in Soulville. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I would say to um, any um, people of color who are trying to bust into this industry, please show up. <laughs> we need you there. We need your voice. We need your point of view. We need your storytelling. We need your presence in this industry. You know, every vocation is going to be challenging and have its ups and downs, but the, the effect that you can impact is profound. There's a young woman right there who just did an interview with me and I was so excited because she's a young woman of color. And I'm like, yes, yes, my sister, yes. I need you here. I need you here. We need to be here. We're not going anywhere. I'd rather us all get more loud, produce more, tell more stories, do what you, you know, as, you know infiltrate. <laughs> You know, one of the things I talked to with my Star Trek people after on, on the first season, I said they were talking about my, you know, my, my character's look and all that stuff, and I said, well, I want Rafi to have a, the silhouette of a, a huge, unruly, you know, uh, head of curls. I want it to be huge and unruly because I want people of color, my brown and black brothers and sisters, to see that in 2400 in space, we're still here. We're still here. And do you know what's so interesting about this? This is why I advocated for people of color for the hair makeup in the second season. I have, and she's wonderful. She was lovely. You know, it just happened to be a white woman who was doing the hair in the first season because that's who was in the trailer. And she said to me at one point, she said, you know, there's a way that we can, maybe with, if Rafi has a, uh, you know, a night that she gets all glamorous, she can, we can give her a beautiful long straight hair. And I turned to her and I said, why do you think Rafi would think in order for her to look beautiful, she'd have to have long, beautiful, straight hair? Maybe Rafi thinks she's beautiful the way she is. 
That's why we need everybody in the rooms. Because God bless her, it was an ignorant statement. And of course, once I clarified that, she was very remorseful and didn't, you know, and she apologized. But that's why it's imperative to have everybody in the different rooms. So I, you know, be here, you know, show up, stay in this industry. We don't need an exodus. We need more of an infiltration. The more that any, you know, POCs, LGBTQ, AAPI, BWD, non uh, PWD, yeah, non uh, neurodiverse individuals tell their stories and it are in here, they are part of our community. They're no longer an other, <laughs> they're part of the conversation. And again, that's what unites us as humans, as brothers and sisters, so that you can see yourself represented in the world. And art is the easiest and most beautiful, impactful way to do that. So I would say stay here, stay strong, use your voice, do not become homogenized, and amplify, amplify, amplify. That was very well said. Bottom line is to stay. <laughs> I think that is the perfect time uh, to segue into Q and A. If anyone has any questions, thank you. What an amazing conversation. So, what I want to ask, I'm asking on behalf of my daughter, who's with the um, Capilano University College of Communication in Canada. So she's having a hard time, you know, breaking through into the industry. They keep giving her roles like the spare. And however, she's been told maybe for some roles, you got to dress in a certain way. Sometimes it's unethical. And I say, don't sell your soul because you're trying to break through. So as a young black woman, and she's trying to, you know, penetrate, go through, get into this industry and make it, what advice can I could you give so she can, you know, not sell her soul and take these spare roles with the teller? You got to dress like this, straighten your hair, your hair's too kinky. And she keeps saying, Mom, I'm tired. What do I do? You know, I'm moving to the States. Maybe I'll, maybe it's better there. And I still think it's the same. So, what Mama advice here. can you maybe help, um, you know? You know, it's interesting because I, as I said, I was the chair of the Sexual Harassment Prevention Committee, and one of the things I did on my own outside of SAG and then got SAG to um, validate it, get through legal and all that stuff, is I made a booklet called Sex, Nudity, and You for actors to understand their rights in auditions and on sets, that there should never be anybody telling you to wear sexy clothes or to do any of that stuff. They are taking your autonomy away. Uh -uh, we're not going to do that. You know, honestly, um, uh, you know, I think a big it, it, still every now and then to this day, a big chunk of my beginning in this industry, I would, I mean, I'm a New Yorker, but I would wear like a black shirt, black pants. Across the board. I'm giving you my art. I'm giving you my art here. You'll figure it out, what I'm saying and what I'm doing and the story that I'm hitting you with. I don't need to wear a bikini for an audition. Shame on you to ask me that. You, and the hair, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the hair thing, uh-uh. Uh-uh, no, and no. And here's the deal. I've done many parts where my hair has been straight, where I wear wigs, it's perfect, you know, all, that's fine. But that's on your bill. That's on your time. It's not on mine. I don't need to damage my hair for an audition. When I get that job, you want to talk about straightening my hair, you want to talk about a wig? Let's talk. Let's create the character. I'm more than happy to do that. But I'm not going to do that because you can't see me like this. Shame on you, I'm here in this industry. And I totally understand about Canada. I was just in Toronto uh, about a month or so ago where the commercial strike was going on its 16th month. 16 months of strike for the commercial actors. Canada is really challenging right now. So I would say, as I say to all artists, stay strong in your resolve, understand your point of view, your voice, don't allow anybody to homogenize you, to silence you, to lessen your flame. I often say people ask for me to straighten my hair because they can't do this. They wish they could. I'm going to puff it up even bigger. Because this is mine. This comes out of my head this way. And this tells a story. This tells a story. So I just tell her to not get sucked into the intimidation 
the um, pressure and the concept that you're supposed to look a certain way, look, sound, walk a certain way when it comes to art. If there's one place that our diversity and our uniqueness is, is, should be celebrated and is a powerful tool, it's in the art. So tell her to push forward more stringently. Just wear, wear a black top, wear a black shirt, and just be like, this is, I'm going to give it to you this way. That's what you get. And, and I think also, just to add, I think also it's also important that, um, you know, she, you, she does be creative so she can be creative and then come up with viable solutions, viable alternatives than what they offered. You know, and that's the other thing we I learned, had to learn when, you know, you go to set and you they have you do, you say, I'm not doing this or I'm not saying this line. And then they would ask, well, Russell, what do you, what do you want to say? I go, uh, and then once I learned, okay, let me come up with two or three alternatives or two or three solutions that could work. And then some, you know, and then I think often they appreciate that. And then just the fact that she has an alternative or has solutions that'll, that'll help them see it a different way as well. You know what I mean? And then go a different way. And then oftentimes after that, that may or may not be an issue again because they know, oh, this is a thinking artist now. Do you know what I mean? So she's got alternatives, she's had solutions. So we should, we should start thinking mm -hmm. as well. And that's as easy as like taking a picture, to having her take a sh headshot with straightened hair, with a wig. Do you know what I mean? Here you go, there you go. You wanna see what I look like? There it is. I'm not gonna do this for an audition. I'm not going to damage my hair for the possibility of getting this job. I'm not gonna spend the money to go to a place for the possibility of doing a job. That's on your bill. You hire me, then you set it up. Hey y'all. Um... I work at a nonprofit where we train um, local teens in Boston into getting into journalism and basically taking the first steps. Um, so in the last year, we've been following bits of the strikes and we've had some articles written Thank you for that. Uh, by our teens. So I was just wondering from like that media perspective, how do we keep the story alive and where do we find the resources, especially here in Boston? Uh, in a way that's ethical, but also because we we always think about okay, we don't want to put people in harm's way by reporting. So I'm I'm trying to get advice on that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean honestly, the easiest way. I mean everything's social media now, right? So I would literally say follow SAG-AFTRA, follow WGA East and WGA West, because literally we will put on our social media platforms. We do it daily. You know quotes uh you know people from the, the picket lines celebs or whatever who are saying things we you know put up uh, articles that are pertinent the truthful stuff um and honestly just keeping amplifying all that is what would be unbelievably helpful for us we would truly appreciate it um because the at the end of the day like you know i just told you some of what is in the contract the only way to get these guys back at the table is to shame them is to shame them because they don't care, they're not, you know, Apple and Amazon make more of their money, the bulk of their money on anything other than our industry. We're just a tiny little portion of their portfolio. So they could care less about um, this contract. So the only way is to completely, you know, is to continue to amplify, share, educate, let people understand what's going on, understand that this is a labor issue, it's about fair pay, fair contracts, and just, you know, follow those three, uh, you know, SAG-AFTRA, WGA East, WGA West, and you know we will keep amplifying. Right now, the AMPTP and the WGA are back at the table. We have our fingers crossed and hope that they're going to come to a contract because if they do, we're next, and there's literally no reason for them not to if they get to a contract with WGA. But all of the support that we can get from social media would be outstanding. So thank you for that. Oh, uh, this uh, comes from the OG. Do I have to stand up? Oh man. This comes from the OG corner here. All right, OG, hey. Uh, <laughs> and uh, actually, there's uh, two parts to this. Um, I'll start the first one, and Mark will finish me. Yes, she will. Um, and I'll, it, this is for both of you. On whose shoulders do you stand? Well, I, I have to say I stand on my, my parents' shoulders, without a doubt. You know, my father was an actor back in the day when it was challenging for black men to get any work. There were jobs, theater gigs that my father did that he didn't want his, his three little girls to come see because he felt it was 
not the visual that they, he wanted his girls to see him in. Uh, he hustled as best he could to provide for us. There would be often times where he would say, the food that we have in the kitchen is the food that we have for the month. I stand on his shoulders. I, I stand, my parents, my mother's white, my father's black. When they got married, um, it was illegal in some places. When my eldest sister was born, that was illegal in some places. Uh, my father and Maya Angelou created something called Matinee for Freedom, where they raised uh, money for Dr. King. My dad walked in the Million Man March. Uh, I stand on my parents' shoulders. Um, I, I, I can honestly say that I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't have a career if it weren't for the, uh, the brilliance of August Wilson. And I, I am a direct descendant uh, as I like to call myself a Wilsonian soldier, if you will. And, and so I stand on the soldiers of, shoulders of August Wilson, but I also stand on the shoulders uh, of the, the seven men who I worked with when I did a play called Jitney uh, that I got when I was 24 years old. And these are uh, seven men who were 20 years my senior, where I could almost see the light go out of their eyes. And they would say to me, Russell, you have an opportunity to do something different. God has blessed you. You are special. You got an opportunity. And for two years, I went to school and got a master's in life from those seven gentlemen. And, and also the director, Marion McClinton, because they helped me understand what I'm here for. Uh, they helped me to understand that it wasn't fully about me. And, and that I, ha I still had a, had a journey to take. I still had a, a, a job to do. And I remember Stephen McKinley Henderson s saying to me, he was basically my age now. I'm 49, who's 49, 50. And he said, Russell, he said, I missed my opportunity. He said, because I had, he said, he said, I'm a, I, he said, I'm a revolutionary to my soul and to my spirit. He said, but I couldn't discern when it was time for me to put my fist in my pocket. He said, that's why at 50, I am now only getting the opportunity at 50 because I couldn't decide, I didn't discern when I should put my black fist and put it in my pocket. He said, not every fight is meant to be fought. So if you know, I mean, so I would get lessons like those and many others. So when it was my turn to to venture solo, if you will, to leave the tribe or the pack, I had to remember all of those lessons and, and many more. And I stand on those men initially. And I'll just say one last person, my mentor, Ren Brown, who befriended me in the year 2000. We've gone into our third decade of knowing each other. This man has been seminal in my life as an influence, but also when we talk about mentorship, it was something that was organic because what he befriended me and pulled me in close and poured into me and said, Russell, here's what you can expect. Russell, here's what you need to look out for. Russell, here's how you should respond. And here's how you shouldn't. If you want to be a long distance runner in this race. And if you can strike racism, a metaphorical blow at every turn by what? By showing up. So let them know who you are by your presence and by your talent. They don't need to know every aspect of you that, that might uh, injure them or that, that might threaten them. So your presence, you showing up strikes racism, a metaphorical blow and lead with that. Beautiful. Oh, no. Well, I can't do my part two now after that. So I'll, I'll ask a different question. Um, undoubtedly, you know your popularity as celebrities overseas, around the world. So let's talk about an alternative universe. I gave you a couple of tickets and said, I want to cast you in a movie in Nigeria where Netflix, Disney, Prime X, they're all chomping at the bit to get to the 1.2 billion people that are on that continent. Mm -hmm. And the economics of that are gonna be a lot different than what you're doing here within the system. Would you, would you take those tickets and, and work over there? 
if they employed local hire, if they employed everybody was, you know, they employed the uh, African, you know, uh, crew and paid them a fair wage because, you know, they go like, uh, who was it, Ridley Scott? No, it was uh, um, not Ridley Scott. Was it Ridley Scott? Um, there's, a there's a lot of, there's some big producers who go to Africa to shoot because they pay them no money. <laughs> They, I, I think it was really Scott, and he even like posted a picture one time of there was a beautiful African woman who was topless, and he said, "This is what SAG means to me." Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, S M F, right? Yeah. So I would, um, you know, because it is about amplification, it is about uplifting, it is about giving jobs, it is about you know creating a presence, just like what Russell said, showing up and being and showing a presence. And if I had gotten those things, like if they wanted that contract, I'd say I would do this contract as long as we create a pathway for these individuals to get into the union, we pay them equitably, the, we house them, we feed them, we give them fair um, percentages, uh, and we employ them, then I, I absolutely would, yeah. Yeah, I like what she said. <laughs> you, you, you like what she said, okay. No, I mean, but no, I mean, that's what I was saying. I mean, it is a, I mean, not only that, we benefit from it as well, you know? I mean, uh, because that's, it seems like that's where the industry is going, right? It, it is going across the pond, Nollywood, and every, you know, places, you know, in Africa. So it would, it would benefit us to make that, make that trip, you know, uh, to the motherland and, and be a part uh, of that work and a part of that growth and see where, you know, we can uh, create bonds and, and whatnot. So I, I would, and on top of, Everything that Michelle just articulated. Um, hi, I'm like so happy that you guys are here. Um, to piggyback off of Mark's question, how do you, when you go internationally, because we know what happens in the US and not everybody knows the dynamics, how do you set up that advocacy and activism internationally so that everyone is paid fairly? Mm -hmm. Because it's really important that we're all in this together, but we also know that people get exploited yeah. for opportunities to just be seen on the screen, mm -hmm. but they don't realize how that backfires on people because then like when they take things overseas, it's because they're paying people less. Yeah. And so then, everyone gets the service. So how do we educate the people internationally to make sure that they're prepared for the same fight that we're already fighting in? And then, yeah. uh, you answer that question. I was gonna say, it's really, it is all about education. I mean, it's literally, and I mean, that is the one thing that I have to say with social media that is a good thing, it's an actual tool, is any type of, any, any way that we can educate and amplify, you know, fair deals and equity, is, is um, powerful. And if that was something that was coming across, um, you know, like in my email saying, here's a contract, whatever, I, you know, because I really, really, really want artists to read their contracts, because actors often go, eh, I'm sorry. They just sign away, they don't know what they're signing away, and then it's like, why is my life different? Because they own my person. So you really need to educate yourself. So I would make sure you read that contract, see what's going on, make sure if it's not a fair deal, Talk to your agents and say, I need it to be a fair deal. I need to make sure that the union rules are being followed, which means that everybody on that set would be taken care of under the union, um, which is because they try to do that. They bring like a sag after actor over, and then they try to skirt the uh, rest of it because you're in a foreign country and you have to utilize their union, which is true, but you can advocate for that, you know, uh, at least the base minimums of these rules are followed. Um, and then, you know, uh, the other way is uh, protest, right? So if that was a contract that wasn't fair and it looked like it was gonna be egregious to the majority, then I would use my own ability to say no and say, no, I won't do that until this becomes a fair contract. You know, I, I also believe that um, it's also your relationship with uh, said producers that you're working with as well, because they're usually the ones that are boots on the ground first. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's it's about being a, having a willingness to have that conversation with them early as well, uh, not just always going through your agents or your manager or your team or whatever. You say, you know, um, hey, I want to get on the phone with producer so and so, and want to just like to talk to them, and then you can express your 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 thoughts, your opinions, your 
you know, your grief, whatever your grievances or your concerns may be moving forward. And you, and the truth is, you you want to you want a, a honest answer. And so, honestly, sometimes that might work to the to where you're happy in totality. We might we may at times have to take incremental steps. Then now, then when you get there, if those incremental steps aren't met, that's when you guys say, hey, 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 you promised me this, and now you're giving this. We got a problem. I know I asked for this and I settled for this, but you're not even doing that. So now we have a problem, you know, uh, and just kind of, and also just, you know, at the same time when you're going being realistic with with what the outcomes are going to be, because, again, you are a guest, you know, and, and they do have ways in which that they conduct and do their business. Um, another thing I would say for an actor, I have my money put in escrow. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> you know, what I mean, because I mean, I mean, I've gotten I've gotten cheated here in the states on jobs you know what i mean where you promise me this and then it just, money doesn't come or take six months for you to get it everything like that and so i do now i put have money put in escrow half up front half up front the remainder in escrow things of that nature because you know mm -hmm. yeah you got to get to check that yes Yes, I just want to say thank you both. It's been such a gift to hear you both share your experiences today. Um, my question, I'm interested, um, what's been the most impactful thing that you've learned from a character that you've played that still stays with you today? And during this time that SAG-AFTRA is on strike and we hope that actors get what they deserve, how are you feeding your inner artist? It's a good, great question. Uh, you know, it's funny because it's it's almost like, is it just because it's my roast, one of my most recent parts? But Rafi from Star Trek, um, what I, I really loved about her, and you know, I was talked with the producers about this before we started, was I really wanted to tell the to story about someone who is perfectly imperfect. Someone who struggles, someone who fails, someone who has an addiction, who is trying to do better. Um, because I really wanted to, pull the curtain back and reveal that people who have addictions are not disposable. They're not some weird thing to be hidden. That it's a real thing. That we have to have space for them. We have to have understanding for them. And what I, why that ended up being so impactful is because when I go to do like a Comic-Con, um, you know, one of the, uh, like Jonathan Franks um, said to me when I first started shooting, he said, Michelle, this is, the, this is unlike any other job you're ever going to have because when this show drops, you have 10 million fans or Trekkies all across the entire world, you know, at, at that one moment. I was like, really? And he's like, yep. And for sure, when I've gone to these cons, I've experienced that. And what's been so moving is that I get so many people who are recovering addicts telling me, that because of this character that I brought to life, she gave them the strength to get back on the wagon, to try to live again, to experience life and to not judge themselves because of their mistakes, but to let them judge themselves because of their triumphs. Um, Rafi also has a relationship with Seven of Nine, so I have a lot of people from the LGBTQ community come over. Once again, people have been adults say, I came out, adults, I came out because I saw Rafi and Seven. I mean, what that really tells me is again, how unbelievably impactful art is. It gave them the courage to be themselves, to live. The other thing that has impacted me uh, you know, hugely is my work as, uh, for the Sexual Harassment Prevention Committee. Um, advocating for intimacy coordinators and speaking out against it, uh, against uh, sexual harassment and all the predators that we have in our industry. Because I've been so vocal about that, I've had times where I've been, you know, in the subway or in the supermarket, and people have come up to me and said, are you Michelle Hurd? And I said, yeah, I am. And they say, thank you for your work. And they tell me about their experience being sexually abused. And it's um, really, you know, painful to receive, but I understand that I gave them a space that they felt seen and heard and empowered by. So as difficult as it is to have revealed things that happened to me, 
I don't, it, it, so be it. If that's given other people who I never knew and who felt that they were not um, seen and heard, now that they have a voice, I'm thankful and I'll do it every time. I guess um, for me, I have been, uh, I've been, I guess, labeled, I've been told that I'm like the new black father, you know? <laughs> and uh, it was a moniker that I kind of uh, rejected uh, for the longest time um, because I felt that it was uh, limiting, um, that it was very narrow. And, um, but uh, I was in Chicago and um, a bus driver stopped in the middle of his route and I was walking with my wife and he said, hey man, he said, hey brother, I feel you. He said, I feel you. This was in 2018. And that like kind of resonated with me, you know what I mean? I could just see his face and I could see his eyes and you know, he just said, I feel you. And um, since that time, you know, I've had a lot of uh, young people come up to me and say that, you know, you helped raise me. So then I started to say, well, wow, this is it's pretty impactful. And uh, then you realize the impact that you're having on people's lives. And then you realize that I can't, I have to stop thinking selfishly. And because what, because as an actor, I said, I want to impact people, right? I want to change the way people think about the world, think about themselves, think about each other, right? And playing these fathers and playing these roles has caused people to do that. And, and so it, and so I realized what I had been doing is changing people's outlook at fathers, changing people's outlook on black men and who we are and our contributions and what we represent. You know, uh, an older gentleman told me a long time ago, he says, Russell, you know, there was a time when boats were made of wood and men were made of steel. He said, now boats are made of steel and men are made of wood. He said, what, I, he said, what you're doing is you're bringing that ethic back. He said, but at the same time, you're staying malleable. And so in that, it has helped me to become a, a better father, a better husband, and a better man, because I know that as, as a black man, as black men, as black fathers, we can show up with that steel exterior. We can show up, we can be strong, we can be tall, but we can also be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And we can also be malleable. And so because of that, I've been able to be more vulnerable in my life and not just on screen you know um i'll leave you with this one someone said that uh, you can't lie in life and tell the truth on stage so as so it became me growing into these roles versus you know me putting my imprimatur on them i had to grow into them because I wasn't there, I was actually posturing for the longest time until you realize, no, you can change, you can be somebody different. And so it's just all the roles in which I played a, a, a father that have really impacted me in my life and, and how I show up every day now. Well, that feels like a beautiful note to end on. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Russell, for such candid, insightful conversation, and thank you all. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It's a teeny weeny bit of logistics. I'm so sorry. First of all, I also want to add my thanks. You know, thank you for showing up. Thank you for your art. Thank you for your passion, and thank you for your inspiration. Really. Amazing conversation, thank you. Um, for the rest of us uh, folks, I also wanna thank you for showing up and for being here and spending the day with us. It's been amazing. If you miss some pieces of this, uh, we'll put all the recordings up on YouTube later. I also wanna invite you to join me at seven o'clock tonight at the College of Communication at 640 Commonwealth Avenue, just a little bit down there. Um, the students were inspired by this symposium to create the first ever 
black box film festival of wonderful student films from all around the greater Boston area. Um, we're gonna be starting there at seven and then we'll go on. But between now and then, I hope you will be able to join us upstairs for a reception for the next hour or so. And uh, look forward to seeing you there. And thanks again for a wonderful day. And thanks to the team as well. Thank you.